Welcome to Happy Times and Places, in which I, Toby Haydoke, have asked a special guest to choose a Doctor Who story and to tell me their favourite things about it, and I have to guess what those favourite things are. Okay, before we begin and hear from our special guest, you know what episode they've chosen, it's in the blurb. However, I've heard from a listener, uh, and I want to read you their message that they sent. Joe Llewellyn from the States, a man I've never met, but with whom I've corresponded, and isn't it fantastic that two people from different parts of the world can uh, communicate and be put in contact with each other because of their mutual love for a show. And Joe writes... The eleventh hour. Only the first Doctor Who episode I ever saw. Blimey, Joe. (laughs) Uh, My gateway drug, he says, to this wonderful show. Still my favourite single episode in the entire history of Doctor Who. You mean it was downhill all the way, Joe? No, I know what you mean. I've seen it more times than any other episode. I kind of like it. Can't wait to hear your thoughts. Favourite part, he says, when Matt Smith walks through the images of the former Doctors. I knew what Tom Baker and Peter Davis had looked like, but it was my first view of many of the others, and all the other monsters besides the Daleks. Hello, I am the Doctor. Oh, yes, you are. I knew about the show from articles in Starlog magazine back in the 80s, but it never showed in my area when I could watch it. I became a Doctor Who newbie at 43. School reunion made me really want to explore the classic series. Matt Smith is my doctor. My daughter dressed as him for Halloween. Not because he's my favourite, because he is her favourite too. Thank you to whoever requested this episode. Well, we're going to meet that person right now, but I wanted to share Joe's message with you because I just love everything about it. And the idea that somebody could stumble across this dotty programme at 43, and with an episode I consider relatively new... Um, and for whom, you know, that their first experience of the show um, is so different from mine, because obviously I, I go right back with it. Um, I just think it's funny that we have so many things that, um, you know, so, so many of our stories are similar, and so many of our thoughts and likings are the same, and yet we can come at it from totally different places. And in Joe's case, you know, geographically and chronologically, uh I like hearing from people, so thanks to Joe, uh, who's uh, who's been very supportive of these podcasts. So I'm more than delighted to open the show with him, and he thanks our special guest, uh, who you're going to meet now. Hello, Toby. Uh, my name is Andy Murray. I'm a writer and journalist uh, in Manchester. Uh, amongst other things, I've written a biography of Russell T. Davis with Dr. Mark Aldridge, and I've also written a biography of Nigel Neal uh, called Into the Unknown. Uh, still available from Head Press and soon to be available in an exciting new audiobook edition. Uh, so, um, the story that I have chosen is The Eleventh Hour. Um, I did a lot of head scratching about this and I was very tempted to do a story that had a Russell T connection or a Nigel Neal connection, which wouldn't be difficult, Um, but I thought I'd do something hopefully less obvious. And the reason I've chosen The Eleventh Hour is because I love it. Uh, It's just, I think like a lot of people, within the space of that episode, I was totally won over by Matt Smith uh, as the Doctor. I was totally won over by the idea of Stephen Moffat, a showrunner. I felt the show was in very safe hands. Um, And I think it works as a kind of cavalcade of brilliant elements, brilliant things. And it has been observed that if you hold it up uh, and look at it closely, maybe the narrative has holes in it. Maybe it doesn't entirely hang together. But I think, like I say, it's it's just a whole assemblage of great moments, great elements. So for the purposes of this, I've tried to think about what are my favourite five of those things. It's time for the first Stephen Moffat era episode ever and also uh, to be featured in Happy Times and Places. Um, I hope it's an era that has taken you to both of those things, not necessarily in 
in the right order. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, if the Moffat era is anything to go by with its timey-wimey shenanigans. Um, so without further ado, let's, uh, let's all change in the TARDIS. I'm on iPlayer. I don't know about you. I do have it on disc, but uh, uh, this is more convenient for me. So we're going to press uh, play in three, two, one. Um, so, of course, it's not quite the same as the uh, Russell T. Davis pan in on Earth, but it's the same. It's the same principle uh, that the, the episode opens with a pan from space. And of course, we'd left David Tennant, the most popular doctor. Uh, I, I mean, ever, really. He, 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 he so caught the public's imagination. The show was so big at this time, which seems incredible when it came back. And also, I mean, I, 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 where did you watch this? I watched this. Uh, well, I found out that Matt Smith was going to be the doctor when I was having a drink with Rob Shearman, <laughs> who wrote Dalek, who I had, when the series had come back, I didn't know him. I didn't know anyone at Doctor Who magazine. I didn't know anybody uh, in the Doctor Who DVD range. I didn't know anyone. I had a, had a couple of mates who were uh, fans and that was it. So my life by this point, since Doctor Who had come back, had completely changed. And I watched this in a pub. With a load of old school Doctor Who fans, I was invited by Jeremy Bentham, who wrote Doctor Who the Early Years, which was a Christmas stocking present for me when I was a lad. Uh, so to be sort of suddenly part of that and those names to conjure felt like such an achievement. Because um, Doctor Who had, you know, very much, for a, a lot of my life, very much been a, a, a solo pleasure. Um, uh, I'm just going to turn this down a little bit. Alexa, volume three see how she copes with that she's uh she's she's not particularly well behaved is this lady this 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 lady box in the corner but yeah okay uh, i've probably that's probably not loud enough uh, alexa volume four um so uh, there's a real fairy tale feel about um this early part of the moffat era that I adore, that seems perfect Doctor Who to me. And I remember thinking at the time, oh, yes, Doctor Who in a village. That's so Doctor Who. But then actually when you think about it, Doctor Who hasn't been in a village that often. Um, but it just felt so right. And I think it's because the very clever thing that he does here uh, is that he places Doctor Who in the context of childhood. And I don't know about you, and I would be interested actually to hear from people um, especially as I've not had many later Doctor Who stories nominated for this, which either means I know, <laughs> only know a load of old farts, but actually quite a few of the younger fans have chosen old Doctor Who. And I was surprised. I thought the new series would get, get snapped up. Shows how powerful nostalgia is, really, though, when we're talking about happy times and places, even though childhood is, this, I think, the scariest time of one's life, um, but also the one of the greatest joy. Um, I, mean, I get I get scared of things now, but not but, or do I? Uh, yeah, but slightly different things. But it's not the same as proper childhood fear. This is you know under the bed, crack in the wall. I mean, he's done statues. He's done you know there's the the robot feet under the bed, isn't there? In in Girl in the Fireplace, and a crack in your wall. It's a very clever way of channeling childhood fear and i had cracks in in bedroom ceilings really um that you know were sort of comforting actually because they were they were there all the time but they could dance in front of your eyes and cobwebs i'm surprised cobwebs have uh have, have not featured uh as as a moffatty monster because he's very good at taking you know he, he i think he realized that with the the gas mask didn't he of going just something very very simple very very recognizable that can be if slightly perverted can be terrifying um so you've got a kid who can't sleep um with a crack in a wall and doctor who lands in her garden uh i mean that's just joyous to me that seems i think it must have been such fun to write <laughs> uh and it captures the magic of doctor who and what a great entrance uh and you know what there'd been rumors that <laughs> 
there'd been rumours that Matt Smith wasn't going to be any good, you know. Um, when he was announced, I, I'd seen Party Animals, but I hadn't realised he was that guy. I'd only seen the first episode of this series he did Party Animals, so I didn't really know him. Uh, and the news had sort of leaked, but it was it was officially announced on something like January the 3rd, my birthday's on the 2nd. It, it was early January anyway. It was around my... I was having birthday drinks with Rob Shearman, and I'm sure it was announced then. Um, but it wasn't unexpected because I'd seen it on a forum the day before. Um, uh, and it was like, oh, God, he's a bit young, uh, uh, which was which was a bit of a surprise. And I, he was a blank slate, really. I didn't know. I'd seen the first episode of Party Animals. I hadn't really registered it. I'd quite liked the series, but my, my partner hadn't been that bothered and we, we, we didn't end up going for it. That had been a few years before. And it was only when somebody said, oh, he's the guy from that. that went, oh, OK, yeah. And he's really good. And he, you know, so I knew he was a good actor. But I, I hadn't quite got him down as, as as quirky as as he is. But then they didn't a clip from the Dalek story leak that out of context didn't sound a hundred percent. And 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 a few people have gone, oh, the, the, the rumours are he's really awful and they're really worried about him. I don't know if that was uh, well. I'm sure it wasn't true because he's amazing, uh, and I think he's one of my favourites. I love I love the Matt Smith Doctor. Uh, and he's a present straight away and he walks into a tree. Which always reminds me of a thing called Captain Beaky, uh, which was a, a, a single that I think got to number one when I was a kid about a klutzy um, bird captain thing narrated by Keith Michelle. And he's, at one point he says, advance, said Beaky, follow me, and walked straight into a tree, which when I was a kid was the funniest thing ever. Um, and I'd heard about this scene... Um, and worried about it. I've done a podcast about food in Doctor Who. Listen to it. I'm a, I'm a bit of a fascist uh, when it comes to food. Um, and I didn't like the idea of the Doctor rejecting food because I think the Doctor should be a good example. And I, I love the gourmand Doctor of John Pertwee enjoying uh, red wine and gorgonzola in the Day of the Daleks. I, I don't like the idea of Doctor even countenancing that. I don't like the I don't like pears thing. I don't like the doctor countenancing to children the idea that you can reject food. Because I'll tell you what, if you're one of those people starving in the world, you don't have that luxury. Uh, and and, and I, we, I was very much brought up to eat everything. Uh, I've tried to do that with my kids and utterly failed. So I talk a good game. But my principle is that, um, and I, you know, no, and, I, and it's a hill I will die on. Um, but of course, what this makes clear well, I I hope is that it's like his body is getting used to assimilating things, and doesn't he say it's a bit like when you've brushed your teeth and just tasted orange juice, so everything's a bit funny. So he needs the thing to sort of get his system going. This isn't a doctor that is a fussy eater. I hope that's why I've rationalised it. Um, and as I say, I've done a whole podcast about this, and also, and this that's such a brilliant joke because <laughs> it escalates, and yogurt is stuffed with bits in it. Your Scottish fry something. And stay out. I mean, these are really good quality jokes. And that's what makes me accept something that I would otherwise be very cross about. And I don't think people do this often enough. Sometimes when people criticise a thing that you you like or or do a joke about it, people go, well, that's not funny. And you go, well, no, it it is funny. It's just it's telling a joke about something you think is important. And I I, I think you can tell jokes about things I think are important if it's a good joke. I think that's absolutely fine. And these are all really, really good jokes. And Fish Fingers in Custard is is a mad Doctor Who thing. And the, the, uh, the, the, the pleasure that he takes in eating them. Uh, which I believe were coconut. It's coconut in or coconut ice cream in something. It's it's not actual fish fingers. He didn't suffer for his art in that way. Um, um, but I uh, and and Amy Pond doesn't have a mum and dad. That's quite a, I think a sort of you know an orphan child kind of idea. I know that that changes later on, but but here um, is is very compelling. The lost sort of the lost little girl. Uh, who needs this magical figure to come and rescue her childhood? Uh, that chimed with me, and uh, and I and I think I'm I'm sure I'm sure a good many people, and I think that that's Doctor Who being magical. I think is uh, is something one sometimes forgets about when one is old and cynical. But um, yeah, the I, I I wasn't a fan of the idea of him rejecting food, um, and I was completely won over by. Matt Smith's performance by the quality of the jokes. Stephen Moffat writes very, very good jokes. 
uh, <laughs> and and he's and he just didn't he describe matt smith as a bad drawing of a handsome man or something which i think is just because he's got such an interesting face those sort of hooded eyes with such depth and the apple that comes into it later stephen moffat does very very clever things with time i'm not always a a a, a great fan of the sort of time the 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 traveling back and changing things sort of time riddly kind of stories um for reasons i'm sure i will go into when i celebrate them <laughs> as i have to in this podcast but uh i nonetheless think that the, the way that stephen moffat tackles time is very very clever uh, and the way that he can use it to, to to portray the emotional journeys of characters is is clever and to plant clever bits of plot up to this point what was interesting because of course this was a this was a complete change in personnel we'd had a doctor change um we'd had a producer go but we hadn't had uh, we'd had companions change but this was the first time new showrunner new doctor new companion open brackets s close brackets um so this was the, the weight of expectation on this i mean moffat had a, a, a scripturally not put a foot wrong I'd, I, I'd loved all of his episodes um before he he took over and he was very much you know i think there was a there was a real sense of optimism um that the, that the show was in good hands um I, it, and in fact people who'd been down on the russell t davis stuff and the, there were some um and i think i certainly felt it was time for a change because i think doctor who needs to reinvent itself whilst remaining it's called the same program which is a huge paradox which is a huge oxymoron um and yet true um you know season seven and season eight are the same series and very different programs um uh, and and yet oh look at that the clap the crack in the bedroom window uh and now i'm i can't remember the, the voices that this is see that i it's much easier for me on the old series because my head is full of facts um i haven't had time because i'm a grown-up an eye in a crack in the wall um to uh, you know to have my head full of facts but david de is one of the voices i think he's the voice of uh of of the not of prisoner zero but of the of the the, the atraxi isn't he um, who's a mighty fine actor who should have been in Doctor Who playing uh, a mad professor or a stoical government figure or a, a, a retired old time lord or something. But uh, the opportunity hasn't come up and he's done a monster voice instead. But we add him to the roster of fine actors to have been in Doctor Who, even though he's probably in it for about two and a half minutes uh, and then went for his lunch. Um, uh but there's so many clever ideas within this setup. This spooky old house. The production design is lovely, by the way. Um, I love the stairs without the where the where the carpet has been and it's been taken off and not been replaced. There is some cause there's a close up of uh, Amy's eyes later. They're a bit similar because, again, that thing about something in the corner of your eye, a crack in the wall, shadows. It's it's all about channeling the things that yeah that that terrified us as a kid that that were in our nightmares when the lights were off you know what stirred in the darkness what did our imagination do and Stephen Moffat has used his imagination to craft them into a, a, a you know into a Doctor Who story um and I, I and I think one often thinks that or I do that that the introductory story is never going to be up to much because they've got so much work to do that the story itself is peripheral you know I've, and has already done his introduction where he, he quite rightly points out that actually this this story does its job and tells its story and 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 introduces people always say that that's so heartbreaking it, it, the, the story that all of these things hang on amy's lost childhood amy's lonely childhood the the, the new doctor um and you know 
the job of scaring the audience and, and having something that's that's a bit spooky and strange and actually setting up things that will pay off later in the series that we don't know about yet uh is very very deftly done um but this is so sad, and I know we, re we we come back to this, and I'm not going to sort of get bogged down in in where this pays off later, partially because I'm I'm not <laughs> entirely sure I, I I I know that off the top of my head. I've, obviously, I've seen all the episodes uh, a number of times, but the the timey wimey stuff does does baffle me a little bit um i mean i'll i'll understand it again when i watch it again but it's not all stored up there in my head uh i'm too old <laughs> um and murray gold's music is is delightful oh and look at that the door is just slightly open uh i've forgotten how spooky um this is actually how cleverly it plays on primal fears um and i i do find it somewhat moving that because i tie doctor who in so much with my my childhood and look at that the 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 paddington duffel coat the the bobbly hat she's almost dressed like um you know a fairy tale painting book of childhood um you know she's not well and i know that but, um this isn't so this isn't the modern day of course because it's amy's childhood but it it's a picture box past as well that's a deliberate design decision that figure going past the camera um this oh this heartbreak well we don't know yet but yeah okay it's the next day we think um uh but and look at that but look at even the design of the garden there's something there's something really sort of yeah picture book about it that that lighting inside the tardis as he comes out is great um I even love the way Matt Smith runs. I think he's a great doctor. Uh, he's he's very he's like a tall Patrick Troughton in a way, uh, and has all of many many things all of his own as well. But but that that sort of childlike quality he has that sort of slightly injured innocence. Um, and what I love uh, what I love is that he because he's so young, but also he wasn't you know as well versed in Doctor Who as some you know i mean we've had david tennant and peter capaldi both doctor who fans cast as the doctor but it just goes to show um you know you get a really really good actor who comes in with no preconceptions and i think they showed him tomb of the cybermen didn't they <laughs> and he just and he's brilliant now nina wadia has just been made an, an obe an mbe um but she, she doesn't do very much in this at all she's not the only one of, of quite an illustrious guest cast who doesn't do an awful lot of this but it's good to have her on board i love arthur darville as rory i know um it took some friends of mine a while to get used to rory i i loved him from from day one i think his 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 comic timing is superb um but without him um sending it up i i think he he deftly um balances doctor who's performance needs um olivia coleman in the bed there um uh, which which will which will become apparent why later um i wonder if she was actually in the thing there because she because on the credits she's a bit lower down and the credits are sort of in order of appearance for the guest cast so i wonder if the person doing the cast is just forgot that that was her or whether that that bit was added in later i don't know i don't have such facts at my disposal and nobody really cares what order the credits are in apart from me um uh so here we have amy pond uh, uh dressed as a policewoman because she's a kisser do we have kissograms anymore a kisser was I, now am i wrong in thinking was the original idea that she was supposed to be a strippogram which would have been an absolute lapse in judgment for uh, uh, a program of this uh, style um um is that right or have i made that up well if i made that up i've just i've just condemned somebody for an idea that wasn't theirs that was mine um but anyway a kissogram seems of it but it works because we need it because she is dressed as a policewoman uh and we've got some brilliant jokes about that later with uh, annette crosby saying weren't you a nun <laughs> um 
Uh, and of course, Karen Gillan's good enough actress that she's uh, and, and very versatile because she's done sketch comedy and stuff um, that she's doing it RP, um, which means we don't I don't think you think for a second that she's uh, Amelia Pond. Um, so there's a mystery there. What's happened to that little girl? Um, you know, what's the doctor going to do having been trapped by the police and what's going on at this hospital? So now we're getting to the adventure uh, and we've got the stroppy authority figure of, of the stroppy doctor, the hospital doctor, not the doctor doctor, uh, and poor old hapless Rory, who uh, who is <laughs> who is a delight. He's got such a gift for yeah hap hapless comedy without mugging it. I I really like Arthur Darville. I think he's great. Um, and uh, yeah, she's she's done a lot of comedy, but she's uh, you know she's that's not her job here. She's playing absolutely straight um and the, do and the doctor's still in oh he spends the whole thing pretty much in david tennant's uh, ripped up costume uh some glorious i'm watching this on quite a big screen and it's very cinematic these glorious close-ups and the colors uh which was not as i say, i watched this i was sitting on the floor in a pub <laughs> but in a very happy room full of people um because, you know, Doctor Who was everywhere and was so popular and was so talked about. I think, is that what, did I meet Philip Maddock that night? Was he there? I think Philip Maddock, who played uh, Solon in The Brain of Morbius and the, the, the Warlord and Fenner in The Power of Kroll and he's in The Crotons as well. Yeah, Philip Maddock is a legend, the U-boat captain in Dan's Army. He was there and he'd got a little Morbius monster in his, where his button, where, in, in his top pocket of his jacket. Oh, uh, and I had a long old chat with him about uh, various things. It was a real joy. Uh, I think that was, yeah, that must have been that, that day. Uh, and there were loads of sort of nice Doctor Who people there. And as I say, I've never been part of Doctor Who fandom at all. Um, uh, so I've been on quite a journey since since Doctor Who had come back. And it felt very special. And I, it was felt really special to be to be part of something um and yes yeah, so this this the story proper is beginning and we're about to see the monster of the week as it were um but look at all of that great production design which allows for lighting oh and it's got the the yeah the messed up sonic screwdriver and we lose the sonic, sonic screwdriver gets killed in this episode doesn't it in order just to to redesign it i love a i love a zooming in camera camera and of course he's handcuffed to the radiator which is spooky spooky oh and i've got to choose things that i uh like because obviously i don't get to pause between episodes um because it's one episode uh so here's the monster i yeah i never quite feel like the cgi totally marries with the room or am i wrong that or is that just my remembrance again look at these brilliant close-ups adam smith is the director isn't he yeah i i wonder if in a few years time we might go that 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 cgi is not it doesn't look quite like it's in the same room i don't why am i picking picking holes uh this is a positive podcast and there's a hell of a lot, lot to be positive about in this episode um because it's superb uh, uh and really weirdly karen gillen knew a friend of my then wife and so bizarrely even though all doctor who was coming into my uh orbit just because of this show that I'd done and just because I, you know, as I say, I'd started to use me on various things. And then suddenly my my wife at the time ended up going for a drink with her mate and Karen Gillan, who had been in, who this, it was after this, so was the current star of Doctor Who. And they all went out for a drink and Karen, Catherine came back, my wife, with a picture of her and Karen Gillan. It's like, what? You've, you've just been out with the woman from Doctor Who who was perfectly happy to go out with, with her and, and my friend, who she, again, she sort of knew, um, which is very unstarry of her. And then we went to see her in a play at uh, the Royal Court, the Almeida, somewhere, a little theatre, um, in which she had about eight lines. Uh, 
but Douglas Hodge had about a billion. Um, but loads of good actors didn't have much in it. Esther Hall didn't, uh, and he had a few bits and bobs. It was very much a one-man performance piece from Douglas Hodge, but it showed that she was prepared to sort of, you know, not not dominate the stage and, and, and get the experience at a, at a fantastic theatre. She's since, of course, gone on to... She doesn't need the stage. She's she's a film star and a, a, a brilliant one. She's had a great post Doctor Who career, uh, and this is M Marcelo Marcello Magni. Forgive me if my pronunciation is uh, bad. Who I I think he's he's a sort of clown. He's done Commedia dell'arte and all of that sort of stuff. He's in it in it, and and actually, if you look at his his sort of publicity pictures. He, he's he's got slightly longer hair than that, and it sticks out at the side. And he's got a he's got a sort of clownish, um, Grimaldi like countenance. Uh, he, they've made him up to look more like a sort of workman here, but uh, uh, I, th I think he's very much of that school. And I think he's also, this is the guy with the dog I'm talking about. Uh, he's the voice of Pingu. Um, I think I'm correct in saying. Uh, but uh, that, again, that's a very clever Moffat idea that the creature becomes the man with the dog, but it doesn't quite know which mouth to talk out of or how to speak, which then creates a perversion of something that is every day. And there is nothing scarier than something that is familiar to us that is slightly off kilter and slightly weird. You know, uh, uh, an odd vicar is scarier, I think, than a than a green monster in a way, because the the odd vicar is a is a perversion of something that we usually find comforting or normal. And I think that's where Stephen Moffat scores really highly when he's dreaming of of how to create, um, d you know, Doctor Who stories to uh, uh, to terrify us, which is an honourable aim, Doctor Who. Doctor Who should be scary. Um, uh, yep, yeah, and there's a bit of... Uh, so the mystery's here, the Doctor's going, why? Why? Because, of course, it's landed on the shed. Like the fact he has... Does he just taste the shed there? <laughs> um, uh, this is a fantastic moment, uh, and she's doing it very well. Why did you fail? Oh, ho, ho, ho. that is heartbreaking. That poor little girl who... <sighs> Who, who waited for him to come back and he didn't. I find that really, I, there's a personal thing in that. My dad went when I was four and quite often promised to come back and see us and do bits and then didn't. And uh, uh, so he wasn't a massive part of my life. It wasn't a massive absence in the end, really, but it was the unfulfilled promise uh, when I was four, you know, and, and those early years. Um, and, 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 and it's related to Doctor Who because me pouring myself into Doctor Who filled a lot of the gap that he created, I think. So that idea of a child <laughs> abandoned by Doctor Who, I find incredibly moving. Perry Benson, estimable character actor. He's one of the sort of London set of, you know, the, the Ray Burdises and, uh, uh, and his sister Kim Benson was in, uh, uh, 2.4 children for quite a long time and there's a sort of gang of those I think Anna Sher trained uh, you know London drama school I think Ray Winston's mates with them all and uh, uh, yeah there's Perry Fennick there's a load of them um, and it's not it's not much of a part from him but it wouldn't be such a good ice cream man if it wasn't the sort of oh I know the face but sort of actor that Perry Fennick is so it's nice to see him turn up and do it and then you get Annette Crosby, this is an all-star cast, none of whom have anything to do, really. Annette Crosby, I mean, from our foot in the grave, and uh, prior to that, you know, the reason she, she wasn't plucked from obscurity to be in one foot in the grave. Uh, are you a policewoman now? So, I thought you were a nurse. That is such a good joke. <laughs> and she does it. Oh, actually a nun. <laughs> That's very funny. Um... Uh, but she she's in Edward the Seventh as Queen Victoria, and she's absolutely astonishing, playing the character all you know all through the ages, as it were. Um, she's a terrific actress, uh, and here she is um, doing a, a sort of pretty much a cameo in in Doc Two. But all the stars are out uh, to herald the the new Doctor, uh, which I'm not sure fully sunk in at the time. It's only looking at it now when you go well. 
um, Nina Wadia, Olivia Coleman, Annette Crosby. I mean, Tom Hopper, Hooper wasn't a star at the time, but he is now and he's about to come in. I think he's got about three lines. Um, but it, it, it adds to the sense of luster, but it's unforced. Uh, it just it just adds to the to the ballast that gives this whole thing an air of, of quality. Um, I'm I'm loving this uh, episode. Um, and it's got such a sort of cheerful energy about it as well. It's dangerous and it's exciting and it's sad and it's heartbreaking, but it's it's joyous. It's got a zeal about it and a, it's just beautifully designed, the colours and everything. And, and here's Tom Hooper Hopper, um, who's in the Umbrella Academy now. He's a very beautiful man, isn't he, with big muscles. Um, uh, it's not an enviable thing he has to do, that scene with... Uh, Matt Smith, where he has to sort of stare gormlessly at him, but he 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 pulls it off. Are you the doctor? It's the doctor, the raggedy doctor. Raggedy is so good. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, uh, and obviously the companions have to have a a sort of uh, uh, link with the doctor. Now it's not enough for them to. Uh, just travel through time and space with him so obviously he's been a he's been a constant figure in amy pond's life and that has consequences for the for the next couple of series um and again look the monster is just a big giant eye and big giant eyes can be really scary and on a show where you have to be budget conscious that is a very very smart move um and it's interesting because we think of sort of darkness of being a bit scary oh and look at that yeah there they are in uh in in space uh, and the human residence but they're not talking about the house they're talking about the planet again that's one of those very deft um the answer is hiding in plain sight which again i think stephen moffat does very well where you think they're talking about one thing and actually they're talking about something else using the same words um the did they ever solve the duck pond i don't know <laughs> So, because so, because I was amazed when the Moffat era finished, how many things he sort of tied in with stuff that had come earlier, and you sort of go, "Did you plan that much, really?" Um, but then you'd have the duck pond, and you go, "Oh, maybe he just went, hang on, she's called Amy Pond, so in a duck pond, I'll do something with that." And do, do they? I can't remember. Don't write in. <laughs> um, oh, and it's gone dark. Although it was atmospheric, even though it was sunny, which is. The android invasion i always think is being rather sunny as well and i and i don't think it makes it any less enjoyable we like to think of darkness and rain making stuff sort of cool and heavy but i i i i sort of like the quaint village setting and as i say i thought it i remember thinking oh yes that's how that's how doctor who should be villages with a telephone box and a village green and then you go well yeah actually there's the, the demons is in a village and the awakening and the android invasion a bit sort of but but, but Doctor Who is much more metropolitan, actually, generally. Um, and yet, this seemed so right. Um, and, and, it, and it does, and it's great. And this is, there's nothing ever quite like this in, in the show. This must have been very complicated to do. Pardon me, I think. Um, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a fun and interesting way of showing uh, what's going on. That, I mean, that, that must have taken ages to do. Um, this funny sort of... Um, the camera following and the the doctor working out who's looking at what and it's uh, and this is where we poor old Rory because Rory is actually Rory is marrying Amy tomorrow we discover um, and and of course that's the other thing when you when you uh, are introducing a doctor you have to have loads of doctory moments and and he seeds plenty in here. Um, but she needs to prove her worth as well. And here's Cully from the Dominators, lovely Arthur Cox, which was thrilling because I, I'd done the commentary for the Dominators and I've seen Arthur Cox's Toby Belch. Uh, he was Toby Belch and Sir Andrew Adriachik was Giuliano from The Mask of Mandragora, uh, directed by Arturo Villar at the Ludlow Festival in 1984, something like that. The Apple. Brilliant. That's a great, that's a great trick. I, you know, I came back. I just came back. I missed you. The hurt there 
but the the clever use of time travel and the clever use of the apple uh, and the apple a day kept the doctor away sadly um but arthur cox nice to see him uh as one of the small but illustrious bevy of actors who have been in classic who and doctor who uh who'd have thought one of them would be cully from the dominators and i used to see arthur he used to go he used to always be on the piccadilly line i think wednesday night was his theater night and it was my night at uh at the 99 club in leicester square and so traveling back i quite often saw him on the piccadilly line and uh latterly i thought Do you know what? i'm gonna actually say something because this would be daft not to uh and i said oh arthur we met and he said oh yes hello i said and then you turned up in doc two again and he was sort of like yes yes he said well i've pretty i've pretty much retired now uh and he has and i th- was this his last job i think it might have been um uh, oh, did you see? I love where Amy jumps over the thing and pulls her skirt down. And I love this gallivanting music. Running is very important in Doctor Who, isn't it? Uh, it gives it its sort of energy. Um, uh, and and yeah, I know I know the book that Rob and I have done is called Running Through Corridors, but it does. But when I think of David Tennant herring around the place, that's you know that that sort of energy to keep to keep a show like this, which has to be full of drama and full of vim. Um, he's, he's so good, uh, Arthur Dava. They're all, they're, these three are great. There's a one for, and it's interesting because, you know, they're not dissimilar in ages and they're both sort of slightly quirky fellows, but the Doctor is definitely the Doctor. Uh, Rory is definitely Rory in it and, and, uh, and the status is there and that's not to, that's not to undermine Rory who holds his own, but in a different way. <laughs> um, That's a nice aerial shot. Uh, and yeah, I love the, I love the idea that of course if a spaceship comes, somebody will take a photo with their mobile phone. Um, but, and of course, yes, so the, 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 uh, the sonic screwdriver is about to get destroyed. Now, when that happened when I was a kid in the visitation, that was a thing. It was, and the idea that he could just build another one was never even considered. It was like, no, the, the sonic screwdriver is destroyed. They're always destroying it now in order to redesign it. The, the, the mo- now, that's interesting. The mobile scooter um, going off was, was, was very funny. But I, I see that slightly differently now that I know quite a lot more disabled people than I knew then he's sort of going, oh, what is it? What is this? Yeah, that the the joke takes. I still think it's funny, but I'm, 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 I'm conscious that a joke at the expense of somebody who needs mobility assistance has a slightly different tone to me now. It would be interesting if I was watching it with my other half, who is a wheelchair user, who um, can give you slightly different context to such easy jokes about um people with mobility issues so and i know that's a very serious thing to say about a throwaway little gag but sometimes that we think of things that we and i did at the time think of as being very simple and throwaway take on a different aspect when you're slightly closer to them i'm not saying it's bad i'm not saying it should be stopped but what i am saying is that it it gives me pause now in a way that it once uh didn't or it makes me bang on for a bit during a podcast um so uh that's the end of nina wadia that's it's not a massive part is it um um so yeah she's been scoffed by prisoner zero the voice of prisoner zero is credited to william wilde uh and it, it was ascribed on imdb i think as to, to bill wilde who's an actor who plays a draconian in the frontier in space and then i think it was unascribed to him and it, it, it is it's actually the same guy so another person from the classic series and bill wild was somebody uh, i didn't know much about at all because he's because he's draconian uh captain i think in in one episode of frontier in space but he's not an actor i'd really seen in in, in much else and that's because he he runs clothes stores he has a couple of clothes stores on saville row and is a gentleman's outfitter but the reason 
and, and stopped acting years and years ago, but kept with the voice work. So the reason he's the voice of Prisoner Zero is because he's got a good voiceover agent and his voice was deemed to be. So he's he's come to be a, an actor from classic Who and modern Who from a completely different route to somebody like uh, Arthur Cox, who's just remained an actor and uh, a, 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 as an elderly actor, got a, got a small part in, a, in, in the new series, um, you know, decades after he was a guest lead in the dominators um so different routes different ways careers work but uh, i'd love to interview bill wilde i have written to him a couple of times and a, a friend of mine has spoken to him it's funny because there's a group of diff- different different groups of us who uh, who sort of contact people and ask for interviews and i've had luck with some people that my friend ben or my friend alex and it's alex that uh, that I think has has spoken to Bill Wilde a couple of times has uh, have had no luck with, but equally they've had luck with people that then I've never heard back from. So uh, you have to get people in the right mood, or it's the way that you approach people. It's it's uh, uh, it, it's it's not there's there's not one way of doing it. Uh, it's a bit of a lottery. Um, Patrick Moore, uh, he's a sir, isn't he? Patrick Moore. Um, and I think isn't Amelia uh, Olivia Coleman been decorated? Isn't she an OBE? So you've got Sir Patrick Moore, you've got Olivia Coleman, you've got Nina Waddy. Is this the most? And uh, Stephen Moffat is an OBE too. Is this the most? Is this the episode with the most decorated people in it? I think it may well be. Uh, again, I don't know. I don't prepare for these. As anybody who has listened to my podcast, too much information or indefinable magic, I do enough preparation for those. This is just shooting the shoot uh, or with my friends here as we watch. That's you, listener, dear listener, dear viewer, you, my friends, uh, as we watch Doctor Who and have fun. And I rabbit on uh, saying the first things that come into my head. Um, so naughty Patrick Moore. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, yes, you've got the funny thing with... Uh, as any with Tom Hoffer saying wipe, wipe your internet history and all of that <laughs> which I, Stephen Moffat's sense of humour is quite childish in places but I as a great man once said there's no point being grown up if you can't be childish somewhere uh, sometimes um, <laughs> and uh, although I, yeah I, I, my ex-wife would occasionally take issue with some of the some of the uh, uh that the slightly uh, sexier jokes are wrong, saucier jokes. Uh, so again, it's interesting. It's all a matter of perspective. Comedy is hard because what some people, so when you cross somebody's line, because comedy is about crossing lines as well. It's about saying things that are outrageous that produce a sort of visceral response. But of course, you can then go too far for some people, and it becomes the opposite of funny. And it's 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 hard to do. I think he's a I think he's a very very good joke writer and with a childish streak, but. <laughs> um, but uh, I've got a childish streak too. And you have to, sometimes you have to say things that even shock yourself in order to get a laugh. Uh, and sometimes you'll say something that seems like a really good idea at the time. <laughs> uh, and, and it gets absolutely nothing. You go, that that wasn't as good as an idea as I thought it was. Um, but I do think that the, the Moffat era has some terrific jokes in it. Um, and t- just terrific. I mean, you can do such good jokes in one line. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's all, it's all pretty good for me, and I, I really like this episode. Uh, I'm glad Andy chose this as my uh, as as my, as my first as my first Moffat of happy times and places. And they've seeded the fire engine, and that gives the Doctor another big moment to prove that he's doctor who and and these two and here's olivia come here's oscar winner uh olivia coleman who's in everything um <laughs> she's in the five-ish doctors as well isn't she that's a great line but i'm in everything um i i mean i remember which she, she was in an advert for something wasn't she and and you thought oh she's really good she's really funny but there's no reason why somebody who's funny in an advert would go on to to sort of cut but then she was in peep show and she was in green wing and she just seemed to sort of pop up everywhere and her ascendancy was just sort of she just seemed and you just you would always be sort of slightly pleased to see her always slightly pleased to do us see her do slightly more I remember the amount that she did in this going oh well i hope her career is going well because she's not done an off she's not she, she, she's not the main guest star or whatever although it's of course it's a really important 
role. And, you know, she was doing well. She wasn't, uh, 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 I think history will tell us, her career was doing perfectly well, thank you. So she must have been well disposed towards the series, but people were. You know, it was a popular show, uh, uh, although that said, it's a time of uncertainty as well, because who knew whether it would be as popular, but that's a great image of the two kids, because it's all one creature, which is a, a you know, it tight, it's, it's, it's a continuation of the man with the dog, now it's a woman with two kids, and we have the child's voice come out of the mother's mouth later, which is a bit of the empty child thing, where the child voice coming out of the gas mask which is one of the most terrifying things that's ever been in Doctor Who so he sort of repeated that trick that the mouth effect is very very nice um that d- duck is brilliant I mean this doesn't there's no reason he'd know they were there but it doesn't matter um it's uh he's I, I think he's yeah it's I think it's lovely and he's got this he's got such a good energy Matt Smith uh and and I like her insolent sort of face off in the bitch face that she pulls <laughs> so yeah just goes to show that you know if you cast up and doctor who did in this period because it, it i mean it could pick and choose its actors um and andy Pryor is a very very good casting director uh i mean this this i've i've always loved the acting in doctor who because i think it gives actors a chance good actors know how to do doctor who um and know how to judge it and also bring a little something extra to it that you can't in other shows. And th- there we have the child's voice coming out of the the monster's mouth. I, uh, 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 because it's a because it's a mix up and it doesn't quite know what it's doing. And look, this is the hero shot that he's uh, doing. Although he gets another hero shot later. There are so many moments where the Doctor gets to be the Doctor, which is so which and was vital because David Tennant's footprint was massive um and i think it's very clever the way that the doctors had various moments in this episode where we've gone oh that's the bit that that's the big doctor bit and then he gets another one and then he gets another one and i think the one that's coming up where he changes his costume was a relatively late addition and it seems mad now that that wasn't always there when he's when he calls the atraxi back to have that final hero shot um Oh, and and yeah, so he's done the very clever thing of uh, of of trapping the monster, and and because Andy had sort of said the story doesn't really hold together. I think the story holds together very nicely. I think it's got got lots of uh, lovely little things seeded into it um, to make everything work, um, uh, and showcase the Doctor's intelligence. Um, And that's, I love that. I think that's great. Oh, and yeah, yeah. You, you need a good actor playing this part. And it's not that small. When people say, I, I think I've read an interview with Stephen Moffat, said, well, we, it was a tiny part. I I think it's a, it's a, it's a it, you'd be happy to have that part on your CV as an actor. More than happy. It's not, you know, it's not like it's a, they went that way um i mean it's it's funny because you think of tom hopper having quite a, a a useful part but actually if you probably if you look in the script what it's three or four lines um but he's he gets a decent amount of screen time and a couple of good jokes so uh uh it's perfect it's it's fine but it's uh this is oh and of course because uh She's locked into Amy there, and this is all tied in with, because this is actually the story of Amy Pond, isn't it? Of Amy Pond's imaginary friend coming back to her, and this is now being used against the Doctor. Look at that brilliant face that he's got. <laughs> of course, because he's not seen himself. <laughs> So at the height of the danger, there's a really, really good joke. Uh, And, you you know, oh, oh, but that's so sad and that's so tragic. And it's a it's a guilt trip for the doctor because he's he's messed with that. And and, and, and having a sort of 
you know, because the because the villain is being nasty there, but there's there's an element of truth in the jibe, um, and seeing a sort of malevolent that innocent child now a sort of malevolent version, but the malevolence is born of truth, um, is a is a very clever and nifty trick. Uh, it's very very densely plotted. This um, it's it's very deftly put together, and I remember it being a very very happy room. But I don't think when we first saw it, we realised how good a story it was. I think because we're discovering the characters and the new world and the people and, and, and particularly the new Doctor. But actually, as a, as a launch pad for any season of Doctor Who, I think this is as, as good a story as you can get because there are so many dramatic and emotional high points and so many good jokes um, that... Uh, uh, it's 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 potentially the best launch for a doctor i mean i love power of the daleks so i will reserve judgment um till the next time i watch that um and spearhead but rose is great but rose had such an important job to do rose is very much a sort of launch pad that as a story i don't think it's quite it's hard to it's like comparing coleslaw to uh, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, they're, but they're, they're both very different things. Um, but I do think this is a really strong launch for the Doctor. And this is the icing on the cake, because that was pretty much the story, isn't it? Um, but the Doctor needs a costume and the Doctor needs a hero moment so he calls the monsters back and i'm not always a great fan of the kind of i'm the doctor look me up because i actually think to inspire us when we're feeling our most useless the doctor needs to be a sort of slightly shambling idiot who does does the right thing through improvisation uh, and against all odds but often by mistake uh, uh and and without any sense of imp of his own importance so I'm slightly wary about the I'm the legend woven through time stuff. I much prefer the I save planets mostly thing. That's because I'm not used to... Uh, we were always discouraged from putting ourselves forward or being, you know, we had to know our place and not be boastful, uh, which has never been... Which, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy with. I don't like... Confident people put me off, but I, I think it's probably held me back in my work where you're supposed to be able to network and tell people how great you are i'd prefer to just sort of put it out there and hope other people notice but they don't actually unless you go look me up um let's do lunch um so <laughs> so uh maybe the doctor needs to be more like this in order to save the universe but i i i i pref and i think this is fun arthur darville's very funny um Yes, Amy finding the Doctor sexy is, is, yes, all right. It's not my cup of tea, but that's because I'm an old fuddy-duddy uh, and she does it very well. Uh, but this, this is, I love this scene. I think it's brilliant. Really well thought of. Um, uh, you know, the Doctor on the roof yelling at the aliens um, uh, and establishing that he is the doctor and again after david tennant has been the doctor for five years and basically convinced the world that that is what doctor who is like um and in the same way that you know peter davison had to follow tom baker who'd pretty much who'd done the same um uh i think this was this this was a really hard big ask uh and i th and i think it's nothing short of miraculous and I think Matt Smith is an inspired choice for Doctor Who. Uh, and, and, and you know, having all of this archive stuff, this starts to give it a sense of epicness of, of the Doctor woven through time and through our history. Because although he is a traveller through space and time, you know, our history is very much inextricably linked with the Doctor's adventures. Um uh, and and to weave this all in with the doctor choosing his tie uh is superb um uh 
I don't know what the Hath are doing there. But other than that... <laughs> Oh, look at that. And this piece of music as well. And we see all the doctors, which makes an old fanboy like me do a high kick in the air of joy. And then his face comes through it. Brilliant. I'm the doctor. Ha ha. And, and the way he stands as well, because he's, he's slightly bow-legged and slightly comical and slightly Chaplin-esque. He's not standing tall, bestriding the universe. He's, he's, <laughs> he's slightly, qu he's quirkier than that. And yet I believe that basically run. Look, and that's a hero moment. Uh, I I love that's gonna that's definitely got to be one of my moments. I'm quite I'm thrilled by that. Um, I think that's superb. Oh, there's a slight continuity error 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 there. I've just noticed for the first time when the ship went away, he he put he put his hand in his inner pocket. And then it cut to him, and then it cut to him watching the ship go away again. And then he put his hand in his inner pocket again because of the burning TARDIS key. But uh, I've seen this many, many times. That's the first time I've noticed it. And I love this theme from Murray Gold. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of, of, of Murray. I, I mean, I'm, I am the sort of person that as a youth used to listen to Doc 2 incidental music instead of pop music because I was, God, I was unsalvageable. Um, and I do have the Doc 2 soundtracks now, but I'm, I'm, I think I've got more eclectic musical tastes now. Um, but I, I, I do, I do like the soundtrack and I, and I had a lot of the stuff pre this as the soundtrack to my one man show that I toured and I was on my own and it was sort of played in the pre-show music. So Murray Gold's music, which I interspersed with other stuff, music from my youth, um, is a bit of a comfort blanket, but I, I, I never had this particular piece of soundtrack in anything and I, and I really, I, the, the piece of music coming up at the end, I, I adore. Oh, there's so much heartbreak in those beautiful eyes of hers. Um, the, the story of Amy Pond is really heartbreaking. Um, and the fact that it's born out of the Doctor's clumsiness. Um, but as I say, this, yes, because this, of course, this, she looks up and she s smiles. Um now when you're watching this you think well that's just a that's just a oh we're we're echoing her then and the TARDIS is coming back to the child now you know but obviously they they do something slightly different with it in the future um but the, and again but this is a, this is a fantastic joke because he's already done it he's already done the um, oh, so of course, Rory's not getting married tomorrow. What was I talking about in the village square? See, this is how confusing it is because the, we've got the joke. It's it's two years, isn't it? Which which he's already done that joke. You said five minutes and it was God knows how many years. And he goes away again. And the last thing you expect is that when he comes back, there's been another massive gap. Brilliant joke. But it 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 but it gives us time for this then shock that this is the day before Amy's married. Why did I think Amy was getting married? See, well, I just got it wrong. Um, I didn't think that if you told me before, I'd have gone, I'd have known. See, it's very. Th this is the problem with talking live. Um, you do make mistakes. It's not an official essay. Um, forgive me. Um, but yes, very much worth it for this, this great uh, joke where he's let her down again. Two years ago. <laughs> That's really funny. Oh, it's such a confident start. Um, and it's... I, I forget how... I always think of Doctor of my childhood. I've ex explained that. But actually, I forget how I'm emotionally invested in these episodes as well. Because... These are now very much in my past. Of course they are, because they were they were aired. Oh God, God, these are old. <laughs> That's so wrong. You know they were aired uh, a decade ago, uh, and me ten years ago is very different to me now. And and me ten years ago who watched this had some happy times ahead, some sad times ahead, some difficult things. And of course, they're all wound up. Doctor Who, like, like the writing in a stick of rock, um, runs through all of those developments in my life. 
So the fact that this this was at a period when things were great, personally, professionally, and and in terms of Doctor Who, I sort of when I think about it, I think about that Toby and go, and you didn't realise, mate, that you know, a few years down the line, things had a bit of a dip and were really difficult, and then they look up again, and and uh, and and that's that's where time travel really gets interesting for me and why i understand why stephen moffat explores it as a dramatic writer because there is something moving about the idea that when you're sad at a point you actually don't know what's that in two years time this amazing thing's going to happen or to have this sadness it opens the door to that happiness or vice versa you're going through that wonderful thing of oh, all these amazing things happening you don't know that they're already the that they're spiraling out of control towards their you know unraveling or destruction time is cruel um, because it is so much larger than us. Uh, uh, we are its playthings. Uh, uh, we are its jokes, you know, because it's got the last laugh on us, because it, it knows what happens to us, you know, and it knows everything that happened before us and everything that's going to happen after we're gone and forgotten. And we think that right now, everything that happens right now is so desperately important. And, of course, to time, it's nothing. Um, and that is you know extraordinary in terms of its dramatic potential which as i say stephen moffat decided to explore to use doctor who to use time travel in doctor who as a storytelling device which i don't always get on with but talking about it now you can absolutely see why and i do find it i do find it quite moving i, I haven't revisited this this era in a while actually uh and i'm finding it's opening up all sorts of uh, thoughts and memories and idea and there's the crack on the thing that's a that's a very clever subtle little moment that he does uh he's so good he's such a deft he's such a deft actor he is the doctor matt smith is the doctor um brilliant piece of casting and i know that Stephen moffat you know what he did he wanted an older man didn't he, he wanted a middle-aged man and uh matt smith came in and blew them away and I'm a madman with a box. <laughs> That's a great laugh that he gives. <laughs> oh, and that, and, and that sense of adventure. That's what Doctor Who has to be as well. Fun, scary fun. Uh, and you have to be a good writer and producer to get that balance right. And, you know, Russell T. Davis and David Tennant had done such an amazing job um that 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 this the confidence of this start is breathtaking and this is glorious and this piece of music i absolutely adore this fairy tale vibe that ends with all your childhood drawings and dolls of doctor who with a wedding and isn't that that's 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 childhood transforming into adulthood and that's that's our life with with doctor who as well um all in one panning shot uh and you know a great gag to it well not a gag but a kind of oh my god you know it's changed what we thought we knew at the very end of the episode uh and oh give me a throw forward to a season uh anytime this oh looks all so exciting and um oh my god and some of this is from the last episodes uh um and look at that breathtaking stuff um Oh, and she got the biggest cheer in the pub when she appeared. And you went, oh, okay, she's gonna, she's popular already. Um, th do you know what? This is, this, this is making me want to watch the whole season. This looks like the most exciting thing ever. And as I say, I'm watching it on a slightly bigger screen than I've ever seen it on before. This is incredible. I, 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 I really want to watch this whole season of Doctor Who. You know, I've seen the Weeping Angel story a few times uh, in the past couple of years, but a lot of this I haven't seen for donkeys, um, and, and I'm I'm I, <laughs> I, I'm absolutely desperate. And look at these guest stars going out. And I don't think I'd known Toby Jones was going to be in it, um, so that was a bit exciting. Um, James Corden, yeah, Bill Nye, all star cast. All star cast, Helen McCrory, my goodness. Um, 
And of course, they're showing a heck of a lot of footage from the forthcoming season. But it's brilliantly pieced together. This trailer's a million dollars. Um, yes, please. I want to watch the whole thing right now. Oh, look at that. Yes, please. I thought that was absolutely incredible. Um, but yeah, I think it is. I think it is in order of appearance, except they haven't counted the shot of uh, 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 Olivia Coleman in the uh, in the uh, in the hospital bed. So I wonder if that was a, a shot they did later, or whether they just uh, didn't notice. Um, otherwise, she'd be higher up on the credits. Nobody cares, Toby. Only you. And what you should be doing is thinking of. And I very deftly then pressed a button on my remote so that the credits didn't cut short, which is what they do on iPlayer, which I think is absolutely shocking for a public service broadcaster. Myself, uh, on, uh, on a platform that uh, doesn't need you to, um, uh, to keep you from switching over to what's on the other side because it's, um, cause you're watching in your own time. Uh, now, I have... Now, where did I put the pen? Oh, God, you see, I got all set up. I was holding the pen because I was where it was making a noise. Um, well, I don't need to write stuff down now anyway because I was supposed to be writing it down during the episode in order that I didn't now spend 20 minutes floundering on choosing my five favourite things. Um, I mean, I had a pen. I had a pen. Where? Oh, no, that's a dog clicker. I could just move. I could just go and get another pen. But this is annoying. The pen was on the sofa. I've gone to get a pen. I now have two pens. This, my life does this. I, I, let's not get into that. Right. Okay. Hello, everybody. What are my five favourite things? Well, definitely the rooftop scene, uh, which I adore. Uh, I would say the Murray Gold Doctor, Doctor theme, uh, which I think is, is terrific. I think the idea of tying Doctor Who in with childhood uh which i think is a is a really important part of the not just the emotional pull of that story but the but the atmosphere of it that i find so captivating um uh, i i uh, yeah i just i just think i find very moving um but also you know that that helps with the plot as well um uh well, do I say Olivia Coleman because she's really good? Do I say the crack in the wall because it's that it's that idea of the, of the you know of the ordinary everyday childhood thing uh, being the key to the terror? Uh, do I say fish? Do I say the food scene because I it is a very it is a very funny food scene. <laughs> um, I could just say the casting of Matt Smith because it was genius. Um, yeah, I think I have to say the casting of Matt Smith because I think too often in this, there's early episodes where, you know, I've struggled to find something and not said it was Roger Delgado's first episode. Do you know what I mean? Um and I can sometimes take the regulars a little bit for granted. Um, but so much was hanging on Matt Smith. And we'd been set up, as I say, some pesky whisperers were going, he's going to be terrible, you know, there's rumours, there's rumours he's awful. Um, and, and I don't know whether that was just <laughs> uh, mischief making or whether, I don't know. Yeah, it must have been because he's obviously brilliant. But the casting of Matt Smith was so important. I mean, it's always important, but I think at that time, you know, so much was hanging on that. And I think also because we knew Moffat was good, uh, um, you know, he'd, he'd proved his credentials in a way. The big question mark was 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 Matt Smith, really, uh, especially when, you know, yeah, it's a new it's a new doctor, but also it's a new doctor and he's somebody we don't know. And he's really young. The casting of Matt Smith 
the the tying it in with the childhood the Murray Gold theme the rooftop scene and one more thing which will be well, I got see I like Prisoner Zero being the you know having the dog and being the kid do I do Prisoner Zero do I do Prisoner Zero or do I do Fish Fingers in Custard what do you think viewer and listener at home uh the fish fingers and custard has so many good jokes in it and that's oh because doctor who having good monsters is important and scary ideas and doctor who having good jokes is important which is most important well which have i done less of the theme the rooftop scene doctor who with childhood casting a matt smith you see, my head's telling me that that's quite Matt Smith heavy. So doing the fish fingers and custard scene is not the same balance as going. Uh, I like, uh, you know, I like Olivia Coleman. I like the child's voice coming out of the mother. I like the dog's voice coming out of Prisoner Zero. And yet, so if I was writing a an essay covering the multifaceted appeals of it, but I love fish fingers and custard, especially as especially as it does that clever as it makes me laugh at something that i don't agree with uh which i think is important for us to do to you know to do a thing that, to find a thing that I, I i might if i was to be so inclined to go well i don't approve of that scene's attitude towards food and it actually makes me just go oh get over yourself it's really funny uh and it and it helps establish the doctor and his relationship with amy i can go fish fingers and custard but that that ties in with the whole the whole of that food exchange. So, so those are my five things. What is my friend Andy Murray? Oh, Andy Murray, by the way. Uh, well, let's. Yeah, Andy Murray uh, is is an expert on Nigel Neal and Quatermass, and I sort of know my Nigel Neal and Quatermass too. I've researched Quatermass extremely heavily, uh, and and have letters from a lot of the cast and crew who are now dead. Um, uh, uh, and and uh, uh, corresponded with many of those people, the designer Clifford Hatz and people like that, for for years and years and years. Uh, and I once on stage at a comedy club, uh, as a, just threw in a mention to Quatermass, just to amuse myself. And this man happened to be in the audience and came up to me and said, "Oh, you mentioned Quatermass." And I said, "Yeah." He said, oh, "I'm writing a biography of Nigel Neal." Uh, and I went, what? And it was this chap, Andy, who happened to just be in on that night. He wasn't a regular at the club. And he now literally lives five minutes walk from here. So the two people that I can confidently say know more about Quatermass than anybody else, the TV series, uh, than anybody else, <laughs> uh, uh, live within five minutes of each other and only managed to know who each who each of the other one was because because one of them th threw in a reference which i'd never done before and don't make a habit of doing isn't it a strange old world um so uh so yeah i'm at andy in a pub and i watched the 11th hour in a pub oh there's symmetry to it all so what has andy liked about the 11th hour uh and the thing that i love uh the first thing that i love about the 11th hour uh, is I love um, the um, kitchen scene between the Doctor and little Amelia, um, which is very celebrated. Maybe it's a fairly obvious thing to say, but rewatching it again, it just strikes you that it does what the episode does, but in microcosm. So it's that thing if you really just met the 11th Doctor, Amelia has just met him too. And over the course of that scene, that montage of scenes, you get to know him, she gets to know him, you get to know him through her eyes, you get to find him funny, you get to find him strange, and uh, it, it just starts the process of winning you over. Lots of little quotable lines in there. It, it just, I, I, I still like it very much. Yes, so, uh, one, one, one point to me, because I chose the, the fish fingers of custard. And I'm, I'm not sure I, 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 I think I slightly took for granted, because I've only recently released um or edited the the podcast i do about food in doctor who and and my thing of not approving of it is that i don't think the doctor should be a fussy eater because i think he should encourage children and young people to try everything and to be curious about food not to reject it i think that's i think that's an important thing um 
just to set it in as an example for kids, but also philosophically, I'm, I'm I don't have an awful lot of time for fussy eaters um, or a lot of patience because I cook and I, I like to entertain. And when you've put all that effort into something, and somebody goes, oh, I don't like tomatoes because um, I was made to eat everything and stuff that I didn't like, I learned to like because my mother had grown it and she'd cooked it, and that's all there was. Uh, and I think it's a luxury of the Western world in the 21st century uh, to just go, I don't like that. Uh, and you'll notice I'm being disparaging about people by putting on an awful voice to make them sound terrible. And I'm sure there are lots of lovely people who, uh, have, for various reasons, have perfectly good reasons not to like food. I'm not, but but when I'm being an old stick in the mud, I don't care. Um, <laughs> but so that was why I thought I might have antipathy to that scene. But as he says, there are so many good jokes in it, uh, and it serves to establish that that brilliant rapport so we both chose the same thing one to me none to andy what's his second thing <clears throat> the second thing that i like uh, about the 11th hour is that wonderful image of the eyeball peeking through the crack in amelia's bedroom um the atraxy as it turns out not maybe a very novel image uh, it's something that's been done quite a lot in science fiction and fantasy this idea of you know quite a surreal image of a a big eyeball staring through a window or whatever but it works really well here i think as a shorthand for a threat and it's just it is i think genuinely quite chilling uh when when it the crack opens and, and it peers through later in the episode you see the eyeball uh on a tv screen and maybe there are itv jokes in that i don't know they're there to be found i think if you want them and Yep, the eyeball, I talked about how simple that was. Um, simple but effective, ITV, hadn't thought of that. And it is, the eyeball in the crack, two very, very simple things, making for a scary image. Yeah, I think it's great. It, 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 uh, not as powerful for me as other things in the episode, uh, or just maybe not this time. Or Well, I didn't choose it. You know, I didn't choose it. I could perfectly understand why, why he did. Um, and now it's one all. Hi, hi. Okay, number three. And the third thing that I love about the eleventh hour, um, I love the Doctor's, the Jeff's big moment, oh. uh, courtesy of the Doctor. So lots of things to like about the Doctor's brief friendship with Jeff. Uh, but I love that moment where the Doctor sits him down, gives him a little pep talk, and sits, uh, puts the laptop in front of him, and you know, off he goes to save the world. We don't need to see him do it. <clears throat> uh, but I think, it, again, it sort of shows that this Doctor, it does what all of the Doctors do, which is he brings out the best in people. Uh, you know, somebody who was just met in passing, he can get him to help him save the world. It's a lovely moment, I think. Oh, now you see, I was banging on there and I lost track of that. Um, so I was probably talking about something desperately trivial. Uh, and Andy has highlighted one of the best things uh, about the episode absolutely Jeff getting his moment the doctor inspiring uh, a, 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 an everyday person ordinary person and I don't mean that in a patronizing or lofty way I consider myself uh, an ordinary all of us are ordinary people who who are all capable of great things if we allow ourselves to be human beings have such potential that is often squandered on triviality and short-sightedness or lack of self-esteem uh, and the Doctor inspires, and the Doctor often inspires misfits who I think have often been told they'll never amount to anything or who, who don't don't necessarily do things conventionally so wonder if they'll ever amount to anything or have to express themselves in a different way in order to negotiate through life and that's not necessarily very easy. And the Doctor goes, everybody, even you, Toby, even you could could, you know, if if you just go for it, if you do it, um, and I and I think that's a really important lesson, and he does it with Jeff, who's a very and, and and yeah, as Andy says, you don't need to see him do it. The Doctor inspires him enough, and he goes, "All right, we'll do this." And 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 it's a, it's a lovely piece of casting as well because he's got that sort of very innocent, straightforward, and and I think it's quite nice that he's not. We've had examples of the Doctor inspiring the dweeb and the geek and the sort of person that a lot of Doctor Who fans are. I like the fact that. Jeff is cut from a slightly different cloth because otherwise the show is in danger of going, oh, only sort of slightly eccentric, misfitty people are are capable of greatness. No, Jeff is an ordinary, simple 
guy who is equally as important and capable of greatness as as you know as the kid that's not very good at sports or whatever and i think that's that's a that's a clever way of just saying to the geeks it's not all about you which i think sometimes doc two fandom loses sight of doc two at its best is about everybody it is a mainstream show that smuggles subversive imaginative ideas into family entertainment uh, and so inspires yeah the misfits but should inspire everybody um uh, uh, and and show that people like jeff aren't ordinary because everybody every one of this silly species of ours has potential to be great uh and yeah good choice better choice he deserves that point because i should have been on the lookout for that and i was probably talking about fonts or something tedious um I am slightly hidebound by the fact that I have to keep talking, otherwise there are big gaps in the podcast. So I'm, I'm going to forgive myself. What's Andy's fourth point? Uh, that's the uh, third thing. The fourth thing that I really like about The Eleventh Hour, and I don't think that necessarily everybody likes it as much as I do, but I do like the line, who da man? <laughs> um, of all the lines to like in this episode and there are a lot um who the man i don't know it's just that brilliant thing that the doctor is building up to this to, to explaining his clever plan to trap the atraxi uh and at the crucial moment he spoils it by telling a crap joke that he thinks is cool uh, and obviously realizes that it isn't uh yeah the way it's de the, the delivery of it, it it's it's very well done and again doesn't fail to to make me laugh uh that's interesting because that unconsciously that t ties in with something i'd said about jokes and about you know saying something and as a comic you do this all the time saying something that you think yes that's the thing to say and immediately becomes apparent that it's not and it's weird because i don't think Stephen moffat's ever done stand-up but he wrote uh, joking apart which was a about a comedy writer and there were stand-up sequences in that although they were dream sequences but that's very much a uh, a joker's sensibility of going yeah I've, I've thought of the exactly the right line and it falls totally flat <laughs> and as andy says it's brilliantly delivered and the fact that he says i'm never saying that again um yeah good choice i'm getting beaten again i started so well can i at least escape a drubbing by having one one thing in common with 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 andy after my initial good start um let's, let's uh and for the fifth and final thing that i like i have cheated um because really these are three different things that i could have had uh, as as three different elements that i love but for reasons of economy um what i love is the chemistry between the three new leads between matt smith karen gillen and arthur darville all of whom are great uh and so even having, you know, even knowing what's what's to come, obviously, I know the, the stories that follow. It's just so exciting to see those characters come to life and to see uh, those performers get get to know those characters and start to start to enjoy it and start to sort of get get their relationship up, up on its feet. It's, it's all those moments with the three of them together, I think, are brilliant. Um Yeah, I mean, I suppose I was close with saying the casting of Matt Smith and I did feel a bit guilty for um omitting karen gillen and arthur darville for that again i think in in trying not to take the doctor for granted i perhaps accidentally then took those two for granted because um because i think they both make superb debuts she's got such pain searing through her but also has a game comic energy about her and he is just such a a, a deft comic actor but like all you know like all proper comic actors he knows when not to be funny and when to be very very serious and i, I and i think he treads the, the the line between what is required from doctor who arthur darville absolutely perfectly and those parts can be hard i think the doctors are much easier part than rory even though they both have to be quirky and funny and brave um uh, as we will see you know rory sometimes gets those comedy clutch scenes that can make you really really annoying and i don't think he ever is um and i think it's that's really hard and i think he's one of the unsung heroes of uh of this period of doctor arthur darville so 
part of me was going to go, well, I'll choose him, but I'll probably choose him on all his other episodes. And then probably when I get to the end of it, I go, I never chose Arthur Darville because I always thought I would some other time. So Andy, you can cheat in this. Andy cheated brilliantly. I could have cheated if I'd thought about it. Um, good choice. Well, having heard from Joe Llewellyn at the top of the show, uh, and I ended up uh, using his choice, uh, the, the bit where Matt Smith walks through the other faces and says, hello, I'm the Doctor. I chose that uh, as one of my favourite things. Um, Nathan Moore says, I love Matt Smith. Is that too much? No. I mean, I chose that as one of my favourite things too, the, the, the casting Matt Smith. But Nathan also says, in case he's gushing too much, what food would you have thrown out of the window in a post-regenerative state? Well, I say, listen to my indefinable magic podcast, Terror of the Onions, and I will explain why I'm very much a sit people down and force them to eat everything. Um, uh, but although I remember my mum used to eat a thing called chitterlings, which are sort of, I don't know, they have their pig's colon or something. They're awful. Uh, and I'm afraid I never gave that a go, and I don't think you're allowed to sell them now. But uh, you'd have to force me very hard to eat a chitterling because uh, it looked fairly grim. Uh, <laughs> and Ian Key, great supporter Ian Key, um, one of the first people to sign up at patreon.co.com forward slash Toby Haydock. Um, I hadn't intended to segue into a plug, but uh, you got to keep doing it. Uh, Ian says... The 11th hour, this always gets loads of praise, but I've never really got why. Am I being a miserable old git, not enjoying it, and not raving about the fish fingers and custard scene? Well, I raved about the fish fingers and custard scene, but as that shows, Ian, there's no accounting for taste, because uh, what some people find delicious, uh, other people uh, don't, you know, uh, don't develop a taste for or even find unpleasant. And that's why it's very difficult to say anything is, you, you, you know, you, you, you can't pretend to enjoy something if you don't enjoy it. So your candor does you credit, but you're an idiot. No, you're not, Ian. Uh, you know that I know you're a good man and I like you very much. Uh, it's all right to not like a thing that lots of other people like. Um, you like what you like. Um, but I hope this podcast has inspired you to give it another go. Because I have to say, sometimes I've... Uh, I've, I've having when I've listened to a podcast of somebody raving about something I've you know been indifferent about I've, I've gone back with a fresh perspective and enjoyed it so drop what you're doing Ian fire up the 11th hour and you'll have a good time I promise you um, Ian and Nathan and Joe all got to ask questions or send in their thoughts because I occasionally um, ask people who've signed up to be patrons um, for their input and I did that this episode. So that's why they are here and very welcome they are. So if you fancy doing a bit of that, you know what you've got to do. If not, uh, it's uh, it's nice of you to listen anyway. Um, but so it's 4-1 to Andy Murray, who's going to sign off by, I think, telling you a little bit about uh, what he's got going on. Uh, so, yeah, so that's the five things that I love about uh, the eleventh hour. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I did, which is a hell of a lot. Uh, and obviously, in real life, we live close enough to occasionally go for coffees under normal circumstances. Uh, not having so much this year, I'm hoping that uh, you know when everything returns to normal, we'll get to do that again. Thank you and goodbye. Oh, that was just a message to me. Yes, we sometimes go for coffee and talk about Quatermass and Doctor Who. Um, in fact, we went for a pint after Dalek. Gosh, how long ago was that? How long have I known him? Ages. I think I think of him as a relatively new friend. My God, there are probably people I know who weren't born when I first met uh, Andy. Well, don't take your friends for granted either, as well as your three leads. Um, I loved that. I. It's weird. I didn't think I could get emotional or so joyous about a Doctor Who episode that's not from my childhood. Because all Doctor is all classic Doctor is from my childhood. Do, you know, I was I was at, I was at fifth form at school. Uh, it's called Year Something now, but I'm not getting into that. Um, I was I was what 16, 15, 16 when Doctor Who finished. 16 when Doctor Who finished. So it's my childhood. 
So I didn't think it would, it would, it, I didn't think my grown up life would have quite so many sort of emotional landmarks or hooks to tie Doctor Who's, my journey through Doctor Who with. I thought it would just be a thing I'd watch on Saturday and really like and love, and it's Doctor Who. But I, I didn't think my life as a backdrop would be quite so profound. But uh, that opened up all sorts of thoughts and memories, particularly about time, which is very appropriate for, for Stephen Moffat stuff. But that's a great episode. I think that's a terrific piece of television. It's a terrific piece of Doctor Who. And uh, I hope you enjoyed watching it with me. Um, there'll be another one of these along next time. Uh, with another doctor and another very special guest. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, c keep an eye on those cracks in your wall because you never know what's going to come out of it. Um, happy times and places to you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for listening to Happy Times and Places with me, Toby Haydoke, and my special guest on this occasion, Andy Murray, who is on Twitter at Mr. Geets Romo, M R G E E T S R O M O, because the Andy Murray thing is quite confusing. Of course it is. Thanks also to the patrons who subscribed at patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydock, who include Ruben Herfindahl, Rob Dawson, Rob Leonard, Stephen Moffat, Richard Straw, and the latest to join them, David Brody, Richard Chalk, Charles Coffin, Russell McPhillips, Justin E. Monaghan, Dave Owen, Peter Reed, Jessica Jones, Dave Hoskin, and Dylan Rees. The music for this podcast is by Dave Gates, and the artwork by Dylan Patterson. I mention again for that Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydoke, where there are advanced releases, extra exclusive material, and you get your name on the credits sometimes, and potentially even a badge. But I know times are tight, so listen, just being here and downloading this thing is extremely kind, and I'm very grateful. Uh, you could also spread the word, though, that costs nothing at uh, all your podcast outlets a five star rating and a positive review can do wonders thanks ever so much there's a one off option too kofi.com forward slash toby Hado. don't forget to subscribe to the official toby Hado youtube channel where there's a video version of this podcast and if you like the cut of my jib you might want to try my comedy night excess malarkey which is on twitch.tv forward slash excess malarkey every tuesday at 8 p.m gmt it's me talking rubbish and then introducing some brilliant guests from around the comedy circuit who might have actually thought about that, what they're going to say beforehand <laughs> see you there i hope Oh, that's free, by the way. <laughs>